Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may have noticed over the last couple of weeks that we have had a large number of baptisms here at the 10 a.m. service. Now, I love baptisms, and not just because they usually involve adorable children being adorable, although that is often true, and it's not just because it's always exciting to welcome a new member into the church, though that is certainly true as well. No, I think the thing I love most about baptisms is that it gives all of us a chance to renew our own baptismal covenant. That is to say, baptisms are an opportunity for all of us to remind ourselves what it is we sign up for when we join the church. During the ceremony, we make a series of promises together. The first one is pretty straightforward. Will we continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread, and in the prayers? As Peggy always says, this is what we do when we gather together on Sunday for Eucharist. But right away, the second promise ramps up the difficulty factor. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent, and return to the Lord. Let's review that. Resist evil, repent, return to the Lord. Just like it's no big thing. I like this promise because it doesn't say if you fall into sin, but whenever. It honestly acknowledges that we humans are flawed and that we need God's help. Finally, the last two promises ask us to serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourself, and to strive for justice and peace among all people, and to respect the dignity of every human being. I come back to these two promises over and over again with the middle and high school youth groups. And whenever I do, I ask them, Who thinks this is easy? No one puts up their hand. And then I ask, who thinks this is hard? And everyone, including me, puts up their hand. The truth is, being a Christian is hard work. It asks us to give of ourselves, often more than we might like, or even think is necessary. But this is the other part about baptisms that I love. Because we don't promise to do these things individually, but together as the church. Now that doesn't let us off the hook, but it does mean that when we struggle and get things wrong, which we will inevitably do from time to time, we have our sisters and brothers in Christ right there beside us, to keep the promises with us. So why all this talk about baptisms? Well, I am so glad you asked. You see, the first letter to Timothy, which we heard from this morning, has long been thought to have been written on the occasion of Timothy's baptism into the church. The letter's author, possibly Paul, is giving advice on what Timothy should expect and how to lead his new life as a Christian. Pursue righteousness, the letter says. Pursue godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of many witnesses. It's a small phrase, but an important one, because it reminds us that our Christian life is not a private one, but a public one. It leaves with us as we exit the building each Sunday and travels with us every day of the week. 
our private and public lives are also our Christian lives. Before and after these particular instructions, however, is a conversation about money, suggesting that the righteous life is somehow connected to our wealth. The first letter to Timothy, after all, is where we get the phrase, money is the root of all evil. But you may have noticed that this isn't actually what the letter says. Rather, the author warns Timothy and us that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in our eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. The letter goes on to explain this more by saying that we are not to be haughty or to set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that we may take hold of the life that really is life. So it is not money that is the problem, but an unhealthy relationship with money. A relationship that puts it and all kinds of material gain before God and before our neighbor. According to commentator Stephanie Mar Smith, real life is one of generosity and good works. This is in contrast to a capitalist society that is driven by competition and self-interest where acts of self-sacrifice appear to limit one's life." End quote. But here, as throughout the New Testament, we see that self-sacrifice is the very essence of life because it comes from God directly. And self-sacrifice is our glimpse of eternal life here on earth. I think it's with this in mind that we can begin to make a little more sense of our gospel passage from today. At first glance, this passage is unforgiving. Abraham looks to the rich man and says, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. It seems to suggest not only that the last will be first and the first will be last, but that some of us are eternally condemned by the random, fortunate circumstances of our birth. I think the crime here is not that the rich man is rich, but that he has failed to see Lazarus and those like him who are trapped at the gate, unable to access the wealth that is just on the other side of it. The rich man has put his pursuit of wealth before his love of God and his love of neighbor. A gate is just a kind of barrier, and like any barrier, it is designed to keep some out and some in. And so we are forced to ask ourselves, who are we keeping out? Who do we allow in and why? And why have we built the gate in the first place? Even in the afterlife, the man treats Lazarus like a servant when he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue. Despite the fact that Lazarus is right there with Abraham, the man speaks about him in the third person, as though he doesn't exist. This lack of thought for anyone other than himself only serves to strengthen the case against the rich man. And it seems there is no hope. The last line of the gospel, though, is like a sly wink to the reader. After the rich man asks that Lazarus be raised from the dead and go and visit his brothers on earth to warn them, Abraham says, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone 
rises from the dead. Well, we have the benefit of knowing that someone has risen from the dead. And we follow Jesus not by command, but because through his death and resurrection, we have been shown what it means to have eternal life, to have real life. Through our own self-sacrifice, we too can share in that life. And rather than weaken or diminish us, it strengthens and grows us. That great chasm between Hades and heaven is not so impassable after all. Our baptism is an initiation into a new kind of life. And that new life asks something of us every day. It asks us to put God and neighbor before ourselves. As we're told by Mary at the beginning of Luke's gospel, we must bring down the powerful from their thrones and lift up the lowly, filling the hungry with good things. So we must live into our baptismal covenants, seeking to serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourselves, and striving for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being. We are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for ourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that we may take hold of the life that really is life. Amen.